So I wanted to share with you a little bit about the Fine Center and, um, and maybe tell you a story, uh, at least my connection uh, with Find. And uh, maybe start off with, as, as I just pronounced it, Find. Uh, this is a homophone, uh, a word that is, um, sounds like words that we are familiar with but are spelled differently uh, about Find. And I say that because I think a lot of us in the School of Medicine know what FINE stands for, Precision Health and Integrated Diagnostics, and I think we know how to pronounce it. <clears throat> but as we start looking across campus, there's a huge opportunity to build further bridges uh, with our other disciplines and, and colleagues. Uh, but the double entendre about FIND is, is in fact intended. This idea of understanding and detecting things earlier has been a hallmark characteristic of the FIND Center. And the integrated diagnostics is a, is a key component uh, of that. And, um, <clears throat> and so this has been uh, something that has been key for us. And I think the, the history of FIND uh, and Precision Health more broadly has been profound. And, and singularly, Stanford's played a, an important role uh, in this regard. This book uh, by our dean, uh, Lloyd Miner, about discovering precision health, predict, prevent, and cure to advance health and well-being has played an important role in not only here at Stanford, but nationally and globally about the opportunities for uh, the growth of this field and the importance of early detection uh, and really gathering the data to allow people to lead healthier lives. And uh, Lloyd has been a pioneer uh, uh, in this regard. And in combination with uh, Sam, and, and for me, you know, looking as, again, as an outsider, the seminal paper with Gary and Ryan, <coughs> led by Sam, about continuous health monitoring, an opportunity for preci precision health, really Sam was among the most articulate in the world about the value of early detection and using data uh, to make informed decisions, really empowering people and doing it in a way that um, drove access. Uh, cost-effective access to data uh, for the masses. And Sam talked eloquently uh, about that. My particular <coughs> exposure to Sam was through the Centers for Cancer Nanotechnology Excellence funded by the National Cancer Institute. And uh, <coughs> this was a, a really exciting program. And you know, as an engineer, as a chemist, the role that this program played in bringing in a lot of people that were not in the field of cancer research, but were taking the, the latest advances in engineering, in particular in nanotechnology, and the opportunities for precision treatment, precision detection, uh, played a really seminal role. <clears throat> and here at Stanford, uh, there were, as you see, there was a network of these centers. Initially, there were five centers. Uh, the one center funded uh, here at Stanford that Sam led that was arguably heavily focused on early detection, uh, which is what Sam was all about in so many ways. The five centers grew to uh, eight centers. We, uh, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, we were one of the original five centers. Uh, and our center was heavily focused on taking the tools of the microelectronics industry, the top-down lithographic tools, to make precision carriers that were useful for drug delivery and vaccine uh, uh, presentation of antigens and adjuvants uh, to the immune system. And this is where I got to know Sam. And this is where I got to know a lot of people on the Board of Scientific Advisors, uh, including uh, our distinguished kickoff speaker here today, uh, Heidi Resek. Um, and to me, this was the, a seminal program, I, I think, for our nation in bringing together communities that have not been uh, together much. And I think it, the legacy of this program uh, continues. But it was in this context <clears throat> that Sam and I started talking about the opportunity for closing the gap between early detection and precision treatment. And we started reminiscing or, or reflecting on both of collaborating more and more. And this started to ref, uh, a, a dialogue with Sam and I about me coming to Stanford uh, in 2014. And, um, <clears throat> and, and it was a very exciting uh, consideration. At the time, we had some breakthroughs in my lab that made that 
um, I wanted to put the pause button on that. But Sam and I continued the dialogue. And part of that, uh, I ended up leaving the university and, and, and uh, being part of a company. And when I stepped down from the CEO role of that company in 2019, Sam was the first person that called me and uh, was questioning whether I wanted to go back to North Carolina uh, or stay on the West Coast. And that started the conversation. And, and in uh, <clears throat> March of 2020, agreed to, boy, this would be a great place to, to re, you know, restart my career. And it was at a time, and again, to share with everybody, that <clears throat> um, Lloyd Miner and, and uh, Sam called me. And, and at this point, Sam was pretty sick. Uh, but he called and, and Lloyd said, we have some exciting news and Sam has a question for you. And exciting news was they had just raised a professorship in Sam's name and Sam had asked me to, to be the inaugural holder of the chair in Sam's name. And so it was a really heavy conversation, <clears throat> but it was um, one that I obviously was exciting to, to try to bridge the, you know, the, the chasm between uh, early detection and precision treatments. And so... <clears throat> That was, a, that was a, a great opportunity for me, and, and I was excited about that. And, and when you start looking at the impact that FIND has had uh, over the years, uh, that's when Sam and, and team uh, launched it, it's been a really remarkable uh, set of um, focus areas. There's been a lot of different projects, but the majority of them were funded in these areas. You know, detecting cancer with liquid biopsies was a big initiative here and continues to be. Uh, and a really big impact, but it you know, went beyond uh, cancer and heavily focused on teen, de uh, teen depression and, su and suicidal tendencies, uh, and we funded some programs uh, in that area. And then the idea where <clears throat> information can help people lead better lives related to metabolic disease and, and, um, and diabetes in particular. Um, but as you also start thinking about programs for extending a life and longevity, uh, we funded programs in, in predicting healthy versus pathological aging and the opportunity for adjusting the course of action there. And then uh, probably the lion's share of our investments and recent investments uh, for FIND is in the, in the new cyclotron. So Stanford's making uh, significant investments uh, in this space. Uh, again, celebrating the legacy of, of Sam and Aruna and everybody. Uh, in this space, and also getting more and more aligned with not only early detection, uh, but theragnostics. So this beginning of thinking about early detection and treatment becoming an increasingly in, important area. <clears throat> and so the, the vision for, for FIND is, is reflecting on the legacy of early detection, uh, but now coming full circle and thinking about more and more related to precision treatments and the coupling uh, of the two uh, areas. And our mission statement is stated here, to develop innovative and cost-effective new approaches for early detection and coupled precision treatments that are enabled by the fusion of engineering and medicine, empowering people to steer their own choices to lead healthy lives. <clears throat> for me, in particular, uh, this campus is um, is an exciting playground because it's got all the different dimensions of a whole university here. And I say that because you know our friends up at UCSF and where I came from at University of North Carolina, we didn't have schools of engineering. Those are two universities uh, that are in the top 10 in federal funding that don't have schools of engineering. And that's a challenge. And there's a lot of great medical centers that don't have schools of engineering. This is one of those whole campuses that not only do we have the breadth of capabilities, but the barriers for collaboration are almost non-existent. And that, that culture of people, we're going to have the last talk today um, from Mike Barber, the importance of inclusion, uh, will reinforce some of those topics. And so to me, this is a, a really exciting uh, direction uh, for where we're going uh, in the Fine Center. And so some things to maybe <clears throat> capture your attention uh, in thinking about you know, what we want to do and this is really heavily driven about access. I'm a big believer that science and technology can drive down <clears throat> the cost of healthcare. And you know, we, we live here in a bubble in Silicon Valley and, and at Stanford, but there's a huge passion that a lot of people have for using our capabilities to driving access. And again, that's another hallmark feature, I think, of Stanford. And so this idea about 
driving, de driving uh, the technologies and insights uh, to use to, to make people's lives better across all gamuts of, of uh, economic um, access is really key. This idea of, you know, what if emergence of osteoarthritis could be as simply detected when you visit a grocery store? And what would it take? And what would the uh, policies be to be able to enab enable healthcare providers uh, and, and people to get that kind of information earlier when you can make an impact on either somebody's gait or how they're uh, living and, or how they're working and, and to preempt uh, the development of osteoarthritis. This idea, and all of us are, are pretty wealthy and, and, uh, and relative to so many, but the idea of getting an annual blood draw uh, seems crazy uh, in this day and age. The opportunity for getting molecular information going beyond these extracorporeal devices that we're all wearing, our Apple watches and our Aurora rings, and getting molecular information at a much higher frequency is a huge opportunity. And, uh, and to have that information so that we could lead better lives is something that's front and center for us. And, and that's gonna take new technologies, new opportunities, going well beyond these extracorporeal devices that we've got. This idea and you know, the pandemic was an eye-opener on so many levels. Telemedicine at Stanford just exploded during this period. And what kind of our technologies can be used to help people make better decisions uh, in that regard? I've always, always wondered why I'm in a radiology department in some ways. You know, Sam, the radiology department here, respectfully, was sort of a land of misfit toys. And I'm one of those, along with card-carrying radiologists who, are, who really do the heavy load. <clears throat> but radiology, in my mind, is about seeing things. It's at the forefront of seeing. And the opportunity, what technologies will allow us to see? And that see is a, maybe a broader definition of seeing. But the idea of using that so that we can help people lead better lives or make changes, and, and the pandemic was a big example of that. And this idea of vaccines uh, and preventing uh, disease and tuning <coughs> the immunological system to help us live better lives is a, is a great opportunity, and, and we want to help drive new technologies in that regard. Uh, and, and to have the, the dynamic information uh, in real time is, is critical. And further, and I think you know, from a clinical treatment point of view, and again back to the core of radiology and why we're based in radiology, you know, radiology is driving us seeing things earlier and earlier and earlier. But a lot of our treatments are still systemic. And the opportunity for precision treatments coupled with early detection, we're still in the early days of that. And the opportunity to avoid the side effects uh, of treatments and coupling those with early detection I think is increasingly uh, clear. And we want to play a bigger, bigger role uh, in that uh, going forward. <clears throat> so we're going to continue to evolve from a strong legacy of what we've been doing at FIND, go well beyond some of the extracorporeal devices uh, and design, innovate, and prototype new technologies. And part of this too is not just to languish technologies in publications, but to have the translational acumen to bring them to market to help people uh, lead better lives. And you'll see a lot of that uh, in, in our symposium today. Uh, but giving people <clears throat> the data and the information, not just the raw data, but translating that and the role that AI and machine learning will have to see pattern recognition to help people make better decisions uh, and modify the course of their disease uh, by these precision treatments, uh, vaccines, and theragnostics. So this idea of early detection through treatments is going to be a, a pivot for us at FIND and one that I think is a natural evolution of, of where we've been. <clears throat> and um, so we're going to be putting together uh, the tools and capabilities to support the, the, the trainees, the, the students and postdocs and, and fellows uh, and the faculty to really help move these things forward. And these are just some examples. But this idea of, of really driving towards this. Um, and we're going to see some of the talks today are doing that, some companies like Prenovo and and others about whole body imaging and, and doing this in an increasingly cost-effective way. Uh, the opportunity for non-invasive tools and minimally invasive tools to get more and more molecular information. 
to understand the ensemble effects of measuring different things, different biomarkers and, uh, and others, to really detect the onset of disease earlier and earlier, back to the core mission uh, find. In addition, this idea of, of, of double downing and uh, the opportunity for the cyclotron and theragnostics will be a key opportunity for us going forward. <clears throat> We're going to have the capability of making things uh, with digital manufacturing tools. And that would be an increasingly important part of who we are uh, to help people do the translation to new diagnostics, new treatment uh, opportunities. Uh, and connection with immunology will be increasingly important for us. So this is where we're heading. And part of this, too, will have a translational excellence uh, uh, focus. Uh, we are big believers in uh, digital manufacturing. Manufacturing science, as opposed to prototyping, is a, is a different discipline. And it's one where we have in, incredible strengths here at Stanford. Additive manufacturing related to metals, additive manufacturing related to polymers, and additive manufacturing related to bioprinting. And so we're now drawing those communities together more and more uh, to facilitate the fabrication of new products, new ways of of uh, uh, evaluating our, our, our product concepts with um, bioprinting tissues, uh, for example. And the key for this, and I sort of just want to emphasize, is that one of the biggest challenges when people launch companies is that when you design a product uh, using prototyping technologies, that there's a huge gap between that and actually realizing something that's investable. But designing products on a piece of equipment that also can scale it up, designing on the means of production, is a whole new onset opportunity. And this will allow us to speed the innovations to market, or speed the innovations to get the kind of investment capital that's necessary. So in partnership with Slack up on the hill here, the Stanford Linear uh, Accelerator, uh, and the Department of Energy, we have more and more uh, opportunities for the method of making. Uh, some of the great expertise in 3D printing with metals, uh, amazing colleagues here in bioprinting, including mitigating uh, some of the needs of animals in, in testing of devices uh, and a more ethical approach to uh, product design. But also, ideally, not just the ethics, which is key, but making it more recapitulate the human system which is increasingly important. You know, we've been dealing a lot with microneedles and, uh, and the, the typical roadmap is dealing with mice. Uh, but you're trying to do this with humans. The anatomy of mouse skin is so different than human skin. Uh, and, and it leaves one actually in information that's misleading uh, and can send you down the wrong path. But now there's efforts here at Stanford to 3D print uh, human tissue uh, they can better recapitulate that. So we can actually test our devices with the right interstitial fluid, the right pressures, the right um, uh, diameters in the anatomy. And so those will be increasingly important for us going forward. So that's the method of, of translation. Another key component for us is all about teams. I've been part of a lot of different design teams and, and uh, research teams in my career. And it's hard working with people. Frankly, we spend a lot of time bridging disciplines, science, you know, chemistry, physics, radiology, oncology. And we spend a lot of time worrying about the challenges of working between disciplines. Well, humans are as diverse as these disciplines. And I will tell you as a lab leader and, and been a part of different companies, it's, it's often never the science and engineering that gets in the way. It's usually the people side of things. And getting teams to work together is absolutely a critical part uh, of the future of translation. And I think the speed of innovation, and nothing makes me more disappointed than seeing something really cool languish because the teams are ineffective at making it happen. Um, there's a lot of C technologies with A teams that make it. But I've seen a lot of A technologies with C teams that die. And to me, that's a travesty. And so part of uh, a lot of the opportunities is, is giving people the capabilities and understanding of what it means to have a great team uh, and role playing and effectiveness. And so we're going to play an increasingly important role of that. And we have a, a center here, the Center for uh, STEM Mentorship focused on teams. 
There's a lot of mentorship activities here at Stanford. A lot of it's focused on students or faculty. But our STEM Center actually brings together teams. If you want to participate in this, you have to participate as a team. And it takes a vulnerable trust with leaders to do that. And this is an increasingly part, a big part of who we are and uh, a part of the Fine Center. And finally, um, <clears throat> boy, there's not been a bigger sea change, I think, I've seen in the last six months to a year than we can see with uh, AI and chat GPT. And um, we should all be prepared for what's happening uh, in this regard. And uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, and the opportunities for accelerating innovation, accelerating connectivity. Universities, not just Stanford, but all universities, are probably among the most disaggregated places to be. There's so much going on. And there's, a thou there's literally a thousand flowers blooming here in a lot of different ways. And, uh, but the opportunity to make connections uh, is ripe because things are happening in a disaggregated way. Just think about the individual departments that we're all in. We think about the seminars in that department. We think about our colleagues in that department. Well, right next door, there's probably another department working on similar things. Imagine a day where if you were to ask the question, what's happening in organoids across Stanford in the last quarter? And the opportunities for gathering that information. Imagine if research group meetings, if seminars, if classes were funneling through these engines so that you can really stitch together a campus in a much more effective way, mine a campus in a much more effective way. This is a great opportunity, probably among the, the greatest opportunities, I think, in higher education and research that's coming. And you know, those universities that now start to funnel all that they are through these really basically synthesizers, connectors, are going to have a huge opportunity to elevate what's going on. And so we're really interested in how um, these collaboration tools are going to play an increasingly important role in what we do uh, at a research university. And this idea about Stanford combined and integrated, placeholder right now, uh, is one that we're thinking more and more about. And you know, the clinical translation si uh, centers, the CTSA, uh, among others, are increasingly focused on the science of translation. And a lot of this is related to people and processes for doing that more than the actual activity. And so we were, we're going to be playing an increasingly important role in bringing people together and help, uh, helping with those translations. So keep an eye all out on these initiatives for translational excellence uh, as we go forward. <clears throat> and finally, I, I just want to announce that, in, again, in, in Sam's name, uh, our third offering here for the Sanjeev Sam Gambier Phillips Fellowship in Precision Health. Encourage everyone uh, here at Stanford to take a look at this program. Uh, it's now live uh, up on our website. And again, I can't imagine a better legacy to help uh, a trainee uh, on their future in medicine uh, in this environment move forward. So please take a look at that. And uh, with that, let me wrap up I, uh, and maybe I'll answer a question or two regarding the Fine Center. Thank you. <laughs>